I think I've said this a bunch to friends and to people in the past. It's like, I think like 70% of being an audio engineer is just being like chill. If you can make someone feel comfortable right before they're going to play, they're going to play that many times better. And they're just, even if it sounds like shit, they're going to be like, whoa, like, thank you so much. Like if you hype them up a little bit. Welcome to White Centipede Noise Podcast, where we give language to noise through long-form video interviews with those in the underground. I'm Oscar Brummel. I run the label White Centipede Noise, and I produce this podcast. I want to thank all White Centipede Noise Patreon supporters, past, present, and future. It's you who make this independent project possible, and your support and involvement is greatly appreciated. Also, thanks to Rural Isolation Project for sponsoring this episode. If you're not currently supporting and would like to learn more about the many benefits of doing so, or to increase your current support and unlock new benefits head over to patreon.com slash white centipede noise. Today my guest is Jackson Kowalczyk of JHK, New York's premier noise sound tech. With his roots in DIY and mastery of professional sound technology, Jackson has made a name for himself over the past several years delivering immaculate and punishingly loud sound at live events large and small across the city. Jackson also makes noise as JHK, with recent releases on Oxen and Dead Gods, and plays in a number of gore noise and grindcore projects. This is part one of the interview with Jackson. To watch or listen to the full one hour, 30 minute episode, go to patreon.com slash white centipede noise. There you can also download the JHK track, Ain't a Bad Place to Be, from his split with Vincent Dallas and Hesling, get access to bonus WCN TV episodes in the Discord server, and much more. Hello, welcome to the White Centipede uh, Noise podcast. We're here as American Liberators, finishing what our grandfathers started so many years ago. We're joined by Jackson. He's a little sweetheart. He's got long hair and a snake. <laughs> uh, yeah. Welcome to the podcast, buddy. Hey, what's up? <laughs> Good to see you. Hey, Jackson. I'm sorry uh, the technical situation wasn't so smooth. I, I should have had, uh, alerted you to the fact that, um, but I had some unexpected guests, and yeah. they insisted that they conduct the interview. <laughs> we just wanted to see you. Hey, what's up? I'm stoked to I see don't know you. Much about, we don't know much about noise, though. Uh, me neither. Yeah, noise sucks. Uh-huh. That's <laughs> <cool>. <laughs> What are we all doing? Could you introduce yourself, please, for those of yeah. us who don't care about noise? Yeah, my name's Jackson. I love rock and roll. Yeah. <laughs> all right, credits. <laughs> <laughs> Off to a great start. You've become, um, you've become very well known in a fairly short period of time. I feel for your contributions to noise, and particularly like live noise. Um, you're known now as the guy who makes things sound good in on the East Coast. I mean, mm-hmm. I, you're living in New York, right? But yeah. it seems like you're not limited. Sit here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll take over. But they're going to stay. Gonna yeah. We're just going to lob the occasional yeah. question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're just here to disrupt things. That's awesome. So, agitators. <laughs> um. Yeah, so you are very, very active, and I'm, you know, on the other side of the the ocean, so I haven't really had a chance to, like, be a part of any of your shows or anything like that, but, but consistently people who I talk to on and off the podcast, you know, talk, mention you as, like, the guy who makes the show sound good, the guy who gets shit done, and, uh, you know, you do really good noise on your own, so uh, it was time to invite you and talk to you, so... Um, I know Kate just asked you to introduce yourself. Um, can you, can you tell us a little bit more about like who you are and, and what you do in terms of your activities as an artist and a technician? Yeah, for sure. Um, well, my name's Jackson, like I said, uh, yeah. How do you pronounce your last name? Kowalczyk. Kowalczyk? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, Um, yeah, I mean, I've made music in a lot of different ways um, for a long time, but yeah, specifically noise, you know, more extreme music, but definitely roots in punk and rock and roll, guitar music for sure. Uh, yeah, I 
have always wanted to work in live music specifically. That's always been like something up. That's always been the dream, you know, work and work shows. I love shows. My parents brought me to a ton of shows as a kid. It's always something I wanted to do. I always wanted to be around shows. So uh, I guess I just, you know, have over the last 10 years really kind of found the niche of working in noise and more experimental music because one, I really love it. And two, it's really fun to run sound for. And I get to like hang out with my friends most of the time when I'm working on those shows. So it just rules. But I do, you know, that's all I do for work is I run sound. I do system installations. I do, you know, sound for stuff I don't care about nearly as much, but it's uh, it's all part of it. You know, it's all influencing me in different ways. So, How did you learn about the technical side of these things? Because it seems like you have quite the chops and DIY, you know, noise, man. Sound guys and noise are like, like notoriously difficult. It's really r- rare to find a sound guy that understands it, let alone like really pushes it. And you know, most of the time it's also DIY. People are kind of just doing things on their own. But if you end up in a club, it's like nine and a half times out of ten, the sound guy is going to be like, uh, I don't know. But you know, so that's you know, in itself, out of itself, that's like a big kind of gift to to a scene and i guess new york city is a good place where a lot of things happen so you're able to affect i think a lot of a lot of shows make it sound good yeah uh, you know i try my best i just turn it up yeah, we have a question right here from from kate how yeah, do you make up? noise sound good jackson you just gotta turn it up <laughs> don't That's be it? afraid <laughs> uh is no that, i think it's accurate? also like the thing of like you know, I've worked in so many places with terrible PAs, I've blown a lot of PAs because of playing noise. I've fixed a lot of PAs because of blowing them. So I kind of know a lot about just like what the physicality of speakers can handle, what different brands can handle, how how to read different amplifiers, you know, all that kind of thing. So it's just like knowing where the physical limitations of a system are and kind of just like riding the line between, you know, actually sounding good and like physical damage to anything, you know, because, you know, in the in New York, especially at a lot of the clubs where shows happen these days, there's very pro systems with, you know, they've spent a lot of money in investing in these installations. And most of the time, these these systems, like, even if I like pushed it in all the way in the red, like it, it would, the amplifiers would cut it off and limit things well before there was any physical damage. But even still, like, even when I'm doing the shows in New York, like, you know, Weston and Kate have been to, it's like, <laughs> uh, I'm like barely pushing the system most of the time. Mm. Um, Crazy. Yeah. It's just also like doing little technical things to like notch out frequencies where it like really resonates and makes it sound like, bad in a room you know where it sounds like painful in a way that isn't like you know purposeful uh you know that kind of thing right not notching those things out and then just making it loud enough to you know feel visceral and physical did you learn any of that stuff like formally or did you have any training to do that um not formally uh i've just like worked in DIY spaces for a very long time, used a lot of broken equipment, you know, had to troubleshoot a million and one other things. Uh, but at the same time, it's like, you know, I've just worked in sound for a long time now, in a lot of different places, small venues, big venues, production companies, lots of different things. So it's like, yeah, do you learn as you do it? It's one of those jobs where it's like, even if you go to school for it, you're not really going to get everything that you'll need to know until you just do it. So I've been lucky enough to have like really knowledgeable and, um, you know, cool people to work with over the years who've either shown me things or I've just like watched and learned, or I've just like fucked up and then learned that way, you know? So it's a lot of that. (laughs) Where do you work like normally? Do you have like a, a solid club that you work or do you work at a few different places there's a few different places i mean at least in new york right now so i'm the technical director of this um experimental music not-for-profit called issue project room right um so i've worked there since about 
2019, um, and over the last, I think, two, a little bit more than two years now, I've been the technical director. And then um, I run front of house sound for some larger venues in New York, one being um, Knockdown Center, which is like bigger club place. Uh, you know, they do all sorts of different events. And then this other place, Pioneer Works, which is, again, another not-for-profit wide range of uh, music and events that happen there. I did a talk about the future of the climate change last night. And I've also, you know, run sound for, uh, uh, uh I don't know, Omar Suleiman there last year, you know, and, uh, next Monday I have Beverly Glenn Copeland coming to perform. So it's like, you know, that got, it's all that kind of thing. It's weird stuff, cool stuff, diverse things. So, yeah. And then I was also working at St. Vitus before that closed. So that was like rock bands, metal bands, that kind of thing. This is a side note, and maybe you can't or don't want to talk about this, but what happened with St. Vitus? Because I just saw all of a sudden that it closed down. Yeah, I mean, real shame. It's just, you know, it's really hard. All I'll say is it's really, really hard to have a venue be like fully... <sighs> yeah, fully like everything is like, like okayed by the city it's like really hard to fully operate a venue that's like fully you know gonna work in every aspect and then it's like the type of thing where they've been there for so long they're very established they have uh, a lot of presence in their small community and then you know there's people that don't like that there's people that don't like the community that that venue brings uh so yeah there's there's always weird animosity like that in new york and i mean i'm sure that happens other places i mean it was even happening years ago with all you know now there's no diy venues in the city at all basically there's like a couple of places that can do things but um that used to be a scene that was like flourishing here and that's all gotten shut down because of the city because of various things even if these places were like you know majority a majority like above board like fully legal you know it's like shit happens people 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 don't want people don't want it around you know landlords want to build condos and sell the land and so yeah do you think there is any like prospect for new smaller diy places in new york I mean, Dead Gods was a big one in noise. Of course, extremely small, but they still did like shows there, and they still did right. I mean, they still did little events and stuff like that. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, like there is, there's, there's more places like that. You know, there's like s several backyards. There's still like kind of illegal park shows that happen. There's small like pop up things that kind of you know that kind of thing. But it's like as far as like a formal venue like there was so many here there was silent barn there was secret project robot shea stadium uh you know like the list goes on chaos computer was like the the last one the glove bohemian grove it, like all these places are gone you know um and what's there's the main not really reason for that what what's the main reason for these places disappearing yeah, well, it's like it's really expensive to maintain a place. Um, a lot of a, a few of those places were shut down by the city, um, you know, for various reasons. Um, and then I think an, uh, another one is just yeah, it's just landlords don't want music venues in their spaces unless they're like super profitable. You know, DIY spaces generally aren't super profitable, but they're like serving the community and. A variety of other ways which are super valuable to you know everybody around what have you guys seen that jackson has done that you've been really like well he that's summer been... scum what right summer yeah, scum right that there's summer scum yeah is yeah kind of mind-blowing mm. um the sound at tvi is like incredible yeah <laughs> mostly due to you i'm assuming <laughs> it's um yeah, I mean that, that's that's a that's a big one. Yeah. It's just a sweet, comforting presence at all these things. Like, oh, yes. <laughs> 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 so, are you like really 
kind of like tuning when you go into a place and know you're doing a show like summer scum or, or, or just, uh, you know, your average noise show on a, on a weeknight, are you then like adjusting and tuning the system specifically for that type of music? Sometimes with, with noise. Uh, I mean like, yeah, I, every time I go into a venue that has a digital console specifically, um, or even just like a graphic, you know, at any rate, I'll, uh, I'll tune the system to where it just sounds good to my ears, uh, and just like knock out frequencies that, you know, are resonating weird in the room. So I'm listening to things really loud. I'm listening to things at volume, but I'm also like listening to like songs that I really know and like have listened to on like, you know, countless other systems. So I can kind of like make it sound transparent. And as the song should sound in a space um so like with noise stuff i'll, I'll listen to a lot of like you know ex uh, electronic music and stuff with like deep bass and crispy highs and you know stuff in the mid-range floating around so i'll listen to a lot of like i don't know craft work and yeah like i don't, I don't know tell us some of your go-to reference tracks oh man i got a lot uh but yeah, I definitely hit Kraftwerk. A lot of stuff from Man Machine. I love that stuff. Uh, Tour de France, for sure. Skeleton Dust is proud to reissue two noise masterpieces from Japanese legend Kazumoto Endo. While You Were Out, originally released in 1999, and Brick and Mortar, originally released in 2003. Out of print for years and difficult to find on the secondhand market, Skeleton Dust is excited to make these pinnacle noise albums available again to the public. Both CDs are released in a six panel digipack layout, plus featuring some never before seen photos. Available now at SkeletonDustRecords.com and at the finest noise distributors worldwide. This Saturday, October 12th, I'm running a giveaway of physical noise media on Patreon for Premium Plus subscribers. Secondhand rarities, out of print label items and test presses, uncovered distro stock, and more. I'm giving it all away for free to Premium Plus subscribers in a free auction. For info on how you can participate, visit patreon.com slash white centipede noise. When you're working on a system that's not yours, you know, do, are you are you a risk taker? Like, are you like someone who's kind of happy to go potentially close to the edge for the sake of like a a show? Is... absolutely yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> sometimes it's very worth it <laughs> you know and you just we worry about it that <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but yeah in general I've, i'm always trying to be cautious about the the venue systems and stuff because most of the time i'm not the promoter for these things and i don't want to get anybody in trouble because you know at the end of the day it is kind of like my fault if something breaks and i'll always take that that heat but it's like um you know there are certain things where it's like come on i got i gotta like really let it rip <laughs> yeah i can't be holding back on certain things it seems like that's like the necessary attitude difference between a sound guy who's like, ooh, because he hears feedback and he's like, that's going to blow the speakers. And it's like, he probably just would rather have it stay at 10% and just know that nothing's going to happen versus someone who's like, we're going to, you know, I don't know, like a race car driver who's like, we're going to, we're going to try to get this machine like working at full. We should be talking about Formula One now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah okay. So, so perfect. So, I heard about that. Um, exactly. But is that, but is that kind of a similar thing? Like a, like a Formula One driver, a race car driver is like, they want to get their machine working like at its optimum like window and like, but close to the edge where they're, you know, they're, they're, they're pushing it past the limits, right? Yeah. So that is. A similar sub analogy? Sublime analogy, man. Yeah. <laughs> that rocks, actually. 
totally <laughs> can steal that. Important question. Okay. That's if awesome. noise were Formula One, what twenty guys would you keep? Wait, what? <laughs> if noise were if Formula noise were just twenty one. guys, like Formula One, which it should be, everything should just be twenty guys. Which twenty <laughs> guys are you keeping? Oh Go. my god. <laughs> <laughs> I don't that's know. A that's, that's a good question. That's, that's a good question. Well, you know, and Formula is inherently political, so I can't. <laughs> Everybody's just a few points above one another. It's not that political because 20 is still enough to mm-hmm. give at least representation to, you know. You don't have to answer it. It's okay. That's a good question. But here's a good question. Guys. Here's another I can't really be the FIA on this one. <laughs> here's another really good question. Uh, if. Okay, in terms of your noise, like which team are you on? Are you are you Red Bull? Oh are you Mercedes? Gosh. Are you Ferrari? Are you Haas? Damn, Haas rocks. Yeah, uh, rocks. Yeah, only American team too, so you know. Yeah, I know exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, the boots are dirty. Wait, so. what's the guy that was crashing into things? He's my team. Logan yeah. Sargent. Uh, no, no. <laughs> He's uh, out. Of, um, no. The, he was the only American too. The guy that was Grosjean. On, the, Grosjean. The guy yeah. that was oh. on fire. Grosjean. I'm Grosjean. <laughs> Dude. The the man walking out of the fire. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Ah, uh, okay. That's pretty cool. Yeah. That All is right. pretty cool. All right. I guess I would say, yeah, he was Haas. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Where's mine? Haas is a pretty years? rocking, rocking. Uh, Rocking team. Uh, I don't know. I love Alonzo so much mm-hmm. that, but I I really don't like Lance Stroll. You know, oh, so I would do yeah. Aston Martin if I could replace Lance Stroll. Okay. Yeah. Also, because Adrian Newey's yeah. going there next year, mm-hmm. best designer oh. in all Formula One, yeah. uh, still yeah, draws by your, hand. Your Stroll partnership, but yeah. Know. Oh yeah, that's that's a partnership. Papa yeah. Stroll's not gonna like that. Okay. So so tell me about this this uh, interest in Formula One because I know nothing about it, <laughs> and I'm surprised that you guys know so much about it, like specifics. Why are you surprised? I don't know. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> well, well, I'm a jock. Ca- a, but wait, car jocks. I mean, a lot of to Stefan, my jock, my jock mentor. A lot of people are jocks, but being a car jock is a whole other level. Yeah. Um, what's your interest? I mean, what's your connection to Formula One? And, and you know, do you do you drive cars also? I love driving cars. I mean, you drive. I assume you have a driver's license, but you know, like, yeah, I have. I have a. I have a fun car too. So you know, uh, but it's Formula One. I mean, I feel like I was always into uh, into race cars, specifically from like a design perspective. Both my folks are very into cars uh and like you know would take me to that hot rod shows as a kid and i was like always really into like knowing the the make and model of you know cool cars as a kid and uh i guess i wasn't really into like racing specifically but my first girlfriend's dad was like a dirt track race car driver and that was like so sick to me actually and then uh, when I was 16 and 17, I, I lived in Milan, Italy, actually. And, uh, yeah, I I was kind of around a lot of folks who were obviously obsessed with Ferrari. And I was going to this spot, um, Monza, which is like mm. uh, an hour outside of Milan to skateboard with this dude and he was obsessed with formula one and there's this very historic racetrack in monza that is like where one of the italian grand prix happens and so he took me there one year uh when when you know there's a race and also just hearing it it's like the loudest thing i've ever heard Mm -hmm. it's crazy auditory thing like you hear miles and miles away I've never seen something move so fast in my life. It was just like insanely like adrenaline, just badass, you know, it was so sick. (laughs) I was like, I've never heard anything. I've never seen anything like this. I was also like obsessed with monster trucks as a kid. They sound crazy too. Uh, So like all sorts of race cars, because one, they sound crazy. Two, they look sick and they go really fast. And I think that's awesome. 
<laughs> I mean, that has like obvious parallels with sound and totally. and also like, the technical side of sound, like that you're dealing with like amplification and things like that. Like that seems like a very clear yeah. thing to be into both. That and like, it's something I'm like really into is like, a well, not like fully, but like acoustic noise. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. an engine isn't plugged into a PA system necessarily. You know, I know people have, but uh, <laughs> you know, it's not necessarily like this, this thing that's made louder. It is that loud just as it is. And I love things like that. So I love like horns and lo- loud bells and all that kind of thing, you know, cause just this like, whoa, like it's makes this huge presence just by itself. It doesn't need anything else. Uh, so, yeah. I think uh, obviously I have to bring up uh, Sam McKinley's like fascination with that kind of stuff because we've talked about it a number of times and he, you know, the nitro dragsters, you know, like the, the pit performances basically where they just like rev those things look insane and he's been like you know into that going to those pushing that and promoting that for a long time now um he recently like showed me something i think he posted on instagram that was like french i think race car enthusiasts i don't know what they were if they were fans of that but they had these little like chainsaws that they had taken the the blade off of Okay, and they were just like revving them as like noisemakers at some sort of event, like hundreds of guys. <laughs> and he also just the other day posted like a serious thing, like a like a video of like a like a like a nitro event, and was just like, we need to organize like a bunch of harsh noise heads to go to one of these events and i was like that is a really good idea you know like that could be a real experience for a lot of people you know to meet up across the country or countries you know we're talking canada or whatever like people actually meet up for for an event and like see it together through that lens oh yeah yeah Yeah, i mean (laughs) (laughs) Say it again. No, I said now he has to just figure out how to get a race car into a pair of stockings. Oh (laughs) my god! I mean, yeah, we Sam and I have talked a little bit uh, about you know the the interest of engines and cars and stuff. And I mean, he's not the only one. Like Damian Romero, of course. Like you know, that's with classic cars as well. Uh, All of it kind of works. You know, it's like, ah, like yeah. I think one thing. Uh, Sam said to me like on Instagram or whatever once was like uh, uh, like why why would anybody make noise when this exists you know <laughs> do you race yourself no I've never done the the races other than like go kart you know uh, which is pretty sick um, yeah <laughs> how most of the Formula One drivers start so yeah yep totally uh, you're halfway there <laughs> but uh, three in no time yeah right yeah easy um no but you know i i have like an older corvette and it's like fun to drive uh but i don't like race you know i'm like a very responsible driver actually uh i would really love to to try racing sometime like on a track kind of terrifies me to do that in the corvette because i'm just worried it's just gonna like turn into like a bunch of bolts and wheels just like flying everywhere (laughs) don't do it but uh another more you know sleek car perhaps uh yeah (laughs) you you have a background in like other types of extreme music right i mean you're a a vocalist and you're involved in like i mean grind correct me or maybe tell me exactly before i ramble on trying to say what i think you do but you're in uh a number of you know more like punk oriented extreme extreme genres right so tell me a little about your background there yeah um yeah, I've played in a handful of uh, grindcore, gore grind, gore noise type bands um, for a while too. Uh, on all all kind of instruments, actually, guitar, bass, drums, vocals. Um, you know, I I definitely come from like a a guitar punk background. Uh, like I said earlier, but just like I I think. Uh, you know, being exposed to a lot of uh, more extreme music, kind of young as like punk oriented grind, more like heavy 
super heavy shit uh even before like i was exposed to noise you know it's kind of like been like a through line um but yeah you know playing drums and gore grind bands blast beats guitars and punk bands uh doing like you know crazy toilet bowl pitch shifted vocals mm -hmm. uh completely unintelligible lyrics that kind of stuff you know uh i'm not super into lyrics honestly i like it when voice <laughs> becomes like a texture uh mm -hmm. I think it's more more cool because I don't really care what someone has to say most of the time. So I've got a question here from uh, Kenny on the Discord. He said, "Ask him what the secret to perfect Gornoise vocals is." Mm. Damn, that's a tricky one. Uh, I gotta give my. This is KPG right now. Yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he knows. I've told him. Uh, <laughs> I the way I do it is uh i run my voice through a uh, pitch shifter super super low so it becomes like almost gravelly mm. and really poppy because it's so low and chopped up and then i run it through a phaser that is like timed really really s slightly with two oscillators and so it like kind of bubbles and jumps when the pitch shifter peaks uh and then a slight bit of reverb and that's chef kiss perfect unintelligible toilet bowl <laughs> watery vocals right there excellent what do you say <laughs> when you're doing the vocals i know you say you don't like the lyrics but do you say lyrics no nah, man it's just like vowel sounds <laughs> ah, ooh, ee, ah, ooh. <laughs> 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 I'm not saying shit. <laughs> I'm not saying shit, especially when yeah. I do like the 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 one that you know Kate Weston has seen with with Seven, our other friend. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that's like I I I'm not like thinking at all. Like I'm just trying to like keep up with him because Seven's doing the drum machine, you know, and I gotta like follow him for the stop starts. So when I vocalize, I'm like literally doing nothing. Anything that I put into that microphone will sound like total trash. So it doesn't really matter, mm -hmm. you know. So <laughs> you uh, recently took Jim and Dries on tour, right, around the U.S. Yeah, we hit a little East Coast Midwest run. <laughs> yeah, that was cool. I mean, how did that work out? How did that pan out that you that you were ended up being their driver? I mean, I, I think when they planned it, they told me there or someone told me that they were planning on just you know, I think that the European dream that they could just do it by bus and and public transportation. Like, oh, I know. Like you might be able to do it in Europe, maybe even though that, that would still suck in Europe, actually. But like, I think Dries told me that was their intention. Like, and someone Definitely. was like, uh, no. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, like, so, you know, S Samantha Parasite Nurse and I went out to uh, Europe last year and, and Jim and Dries were both kind enough to, to book us. And so that's where I got to, like, meet them for the first time and everything. And, you know, they were mentioning the fact that they're like, oh, yeah, like, we're thinking about coming uh, for, you know, a little tour in April. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. You know, like, um, I helped you know, put together the lineup for end times. So like, it'd be really cool if we could get you for that. You know, that's an amazing first US show that would rock. And then they're like, Oh, yeah, let's do that. And then like, you know, do us some other hit some other spots. And so they had already kind of worked out this, this route. And, uh, you know, I was talking to Jim about it. And he's just like, Alright, so how do I get from New York to like outside of pittsburgh on a sunday it, like <laughs> right after end times and i'm just like dude <laughs> like <laughs> that's that's not gonna work like you're gonna there's gonna be like one bus a day at like seven in the morning and if you miss it your whole tour is fucked you know what i mean mm -hmm. so uh you know they're i was talking to them and stuff and i was like yeah you know maybe i could give you the ride around and stuff and like, yeah why don't you hop on the, the tour with us so i just like you know was able to kind of ride their coattails a little bit and and jam jam those shows and drive around with with the guys you know and it was an awesome time I, I i really loved hanging out with them a lot really awesome conversations good good road tunes yeah great great fellas great noise rippers did you use did you have a car to use I borrowed Shawnee's car, um, Jackson Pratt. 
Nice. Yeah, he was super kind enough to let me borrow his car because I have two cars. They're both two seaters. Uh, <laughs> 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 well, wouldn't have worked. Uh, so I downsized from my like cargo van with two seats to Shawnee's like Honda Civic, uh, which was you know flawless. And thank you again, Shawnee. What were your impressions of uh, of playing in Europe versus your impressions or versus your experience playing so many live events in the U.S. Um, I mean, it was pretty, pretty comparable. I would say, honestly, it was just like, you know, the freaks in town come out wherever that may be. Uh, <laughs> some, some, some spots were like, you know, really built out pro venues. I got to give it up for resistor and Lida. Uh, um, yeah. that spot blew me away. I would say like the most pro DIY venue I've ever seen. Yeah, it's great. And then you know, you know, we played some other shows, like we played the the pits in in Cortrike, and that was like, you know, what everything I could ever want out of like a DIY, like, you know, anarchist, badass, you know, urinals, the place where the merch booth and the check in door is, you yeah. know, what I mean? like yeah. it rocked, badass, <laughs> loud PA, grungy as fuck great vegan food like you know mm. that rock so it's like you know i feel like that's uh that's kind of like best case scenario so i had a lot of like best case scenarios in in europe i think you know mm. people with awesome food down to make it loud because they know what's up you know not scared i feel like a lot of spots you know you play in the u.s you're gonna play similar spots places right like you, you're going to play noise shows it's like you're somewhat a, no a friend of yours who's into noise booked you they they know what's up they're gonna book you at a place where the pa is loud or they have a pa that they're willing to you know break and they're gonna give you you know decent food and maybe a place to sleep on the floor you know and it's like okay yeah in europe it was just cool because i'd never been to any of those places before and i was like so exhausted and the food was awesome and you know i was traveling with my homies so that rocked and got to play these badass shows with people i wanted to see for a while and have never you know met before so that was cool hell yeah um tell me about your solo noise jhk do you have other products uh as far as like solo noise no <laughs> um i do like other solo projects i have one called idiopathic uveitis now but that's more like um solo gore noise as well so like you know crazy fast blast beats on intelligible vocals again um <laughs> but done through the same sort of like noise rig i use for jhk just kind of completely used in a different way um but yeah jhk is my my solo solo project um yeah i uh <laughs> yeah it's fun can you describe your noise rig uh it's pretty basic, man. It's like sh two shitty mixers, a couple <laughs> boss pedals, contact mic, tape deck, you know, all the classics. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing too out of the ordinary there. I knew you were traveling with Parasite Nurse, and I know she's heavy into modular and Eurorack stuff. I was curious if you're of the same. No, that's that shit's one. way over my head, man. Like... <laughs> I, I don't even know where to start with that stuff. I think it's really cool, but um, no, nah, you know, I've always loved just like really simple things uh, and just like trying to get as much as I can out of a very limited amount of things, you know, not not trying to go over the top. I feel like, you know, I, I, I had that trope when I when I was kind of figuring out my sound and stuff where I was like, put as much stuff on the table as I can. And then I'll wet wean it down to the stuff. I, I, I actually think it sounds really sick, you know, but till then I'm just going to play with the mute buttons and turn everything on and off, you know, which mm -hmm. honestly sometimes rocks, but, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. I've always been into like, just, yeah. Having, having f fewer and fewer tools as I, go along so that i can really just see all the reaches of cool things i can get out of you know a few things that i can learn really really well like whether that's a pedal or a mixer or 
a certain type of little microphone or tape deck or whatever, you know. How did you connect with Oxen and 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 tell me about working on that CD? Oh yeah, that was man, that was a hard one for me. Uh, <laughs> it was really really cool and rewarding process, but I've never tried to record something that long and have it try to you know make it as interesting to where I'd want to listen to it for 50 minutes you know mm-hmm. uh but yeah I met um Matt and Leah a couple of years ago out in LA and um played a show that um Johnny Cash put together out there and uh yeah just just played and ended up you know having good talks and ended up getting Thai food with with Matt and Leah after after the the fest and you know they just asked if I'd be into it and I was like yeah absolutely and then I took nearly two years to give them a CD but you know uh I I I work very slowly I'm not the type of person who has my gear out um you know so it's like I think about things for months and months and months and then I have those ideas and then I'm like, okay, now I have this like burst of creative energy and just need to make it. So that's kind of how that was. And honestly doing the Europe tour, like honing like the kind of two, two sets that I did on that Europe tour. And then just like coming home and being like, okay, perfect. Now I just record those two sets like in a day. And then like these two other ideas that I have right now, and that's the CD. And honestly it worked, works great. Cool. (laughs) Nice, yeah. cool. But I'm really thankful they they hooked me up and uh, like obviously incredible label, endless support. Mm-hmm. And sweethearts. Mm-hmm. Are you working on anything new, uh, album wise, um, or, or release there's, wise? There's a couple things that I'm I'm probably forgetting. Um, yeah, I think I'm supposed to do a tape uh, for Scott Kindberg. He asked me not too long ago after that uh, tour. Um, if hopefully we're still down. Because um, <laughs> I do take forever and I apologize. I just, you know, I work a lot and I don't. Uh, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't like jam every day. You know, I'm not I'm not sure. like that type of type of person. Um, just think a lot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> There's a couple other things I'm, I'm probably forgetting. Uh, okay. There's a new CD that uh, Thousands of Dead Gods is, is going to put out soon. That's a collaboration between um, me and uh, this project Neuter, um, also based nice. in New York. Uh, my friend Riley, also amazing sound engineer. Uh, cool. So got to give it up to her. Um, yeah. So that that'll be sick. I'm really proud of that material as well. That that should be really cool. If we're gonna talk about like technical nerdy stuff, like dealing with speakers and things like that, oh, are there any <laughs> recent? This is the end of part one of the interview with Jackson, co-hosted by Kate Devoe and Weston Zerkes. To watch or listen to the full one hour thirty minute episode, go to Patreon.com/slash White Centipede Noise. We go on to discuss modern speaker technology, advice for running DIY sound. Managing feedback, Jackson's favorite sounds, more questions from the Discord, running sound for Miyuko Hino and the New Blockaders, his top fives, and more.